Hi guys, I am here with your, um, I'm here with a true story to read to you guys. The quote before this one is by Stephanie Powers from Angels 2, Beyond the Light. We are never so lost that our angels cannot find us. So true. Okay, this one is a little longer. It is called Messenger from Cork. As spring break approached at the University of London, American student Kelly O'Connell decided to take advantage of a unique opportunity. What more perfect time to visit Ireland, the country of her ancestors. Kelly had always been concerned about not having enough money. When you're raised in a family that's struggling financially, you worry, she says. But college students typically travel on slim budgets, especially in Europe where youth hostels charge just a few dollars a night. So although Kelly flew to Dublin with only about $275 and her bus and train passes, she felt confident. She took in the sights of Dublin, stayed in a hotel, well, hostel, that's what they're, must be what they're called there, I keep saying hostel, and rode the train down to Cork the next morning. But the night Kelly opened her knapsack and discovered that she had been robbed, her roll of cash was gone. The familiar panic rolled over her. She had about $30 in her jeans pocket and some bread and granola in her bag, not enough to live on for another week. Her airline ticket to London was good only on the date issued. What would she do? Kelly placed a collect call to her parents in Omaha, but they were on vacation. I'll try to find them, her brother promised, but you probably won't receive any money until Monday or Tuesday. How would she live in the meantime? This long-awaited dream trip was becoming a nightmare. Determined to salvage what she could, Kelly continued traveling during the following days. She eventually reached her father, who promised to have money at the American Express office in Limerick on Wednesday. In the meantime, he advised her, why don't you go to a church? I'm sure someone there would help. No, Kelly appreciated his advice, but she wouldn't take it. I had rejected my Catholic upbringing when I was 16, she says. To me, religion was just a bunch of rules. I was an angry, independent adolescent who wasn't sure what I believed but I had no spiritual connection. The only time I ever acknowledged God was when I was mad at him. That's what a lot of people do. And when the things are going their way, they forget about him again. The only time I ever acknowledged God was when I was mad at him. If something went wrong, it was his fault. Otherwise, he didn't exist. She'd feel like a hypocrite if she went to a church now. But when she found herself on a park bench in Limerick in the cold, rainy darkness, Kelly realized she had reached the dead end. She had 80 cents in her pocket and six days before her return flight to London. Her money was due to arrive tomorrow afternoon, but what if it didn't? She was alone in an unfamiliar city with nowhere to stay. And on top of everything, to top everything off, today was her 21st birthday. What a cruel joke. Tears filled her eyes. Across the street was a youth hostel, she says. I knew it would be closing about nine. They all did, so I took a deep breath and knocked on the door. When the proprietor came, she explained her situation. I'd be happy to clean for you tomorrow in exchange for lodging tonight, she suggested. We are barely open. There are only two guests here, he answered. Why don't you ask for help at the church down the street? Not again, Kelly shook her head firmly. Well, come in, he sighed. I'll find some work for you to do. He gave Kelly a room on floor two, the women's floor. Men were on floor three. She met the other two guests, but I sensed that they had nothing to spare, so I didn't tell them anything, she says. Eventually, the couple went out for a walk. The owner had gone to his quarters after locking the front door so Kelly was alone. 
Slumping miserably in the lounge, she ate the remainder of her bread and granola while tears rolled down her cheeks. Happy birthday to me. She had never felt so lonely. At 10 p.m., the lounge door opened unexpectedly and a man walked in. Okay if I sit down, he asked her. Kelly looked up. He was tall, slim, and young with coal black wavy hair and pale Irish skin. But it was his eyes. It was his eyes that caught my attention, Kelly says. They were the brightest, most beautiful blue I'd ever seen. They seemed old and young at the same time. The man put out his hand. I'm Peter McGucky, he smiled. Kelly O'Connell from London University. Kelly blinked back tears. I've been living in London too, Peter explained, but I'm moving back to my brother's house in Cork and doing some sightseeing on the way. Why are you crying? Kelly told him. Hmm, Peter's face grew thoughtful. Don't worry, love. I'll stay with you until we get it all straightened out. Everything will be all right. You'll see. Kelly was already relaxing. Peter's very presence was calming. The two began to talk of trivial things, of daily life, of plans and hopes. There was nothing significant in our conversation, Kelly says, but its very ordinariness seemed to reduce my tension. Tomorrow, Peter reassured her, they would go to the American Express office and her father's package would be there. Nothing to worry about. The following day, Kelly awakened early and did her assigned chores. The other two boarders left and eventually Kelly tiptoed up to the third floor to find Peter's room and remind him about their trip to the American <laughs> Express office. But all the rooms were empty. Puzzled, Kelly went downstairs and found the innkeeper. Where's Peter, she asked. Who? Peter McGucky, the dark-haired man, the one who checked in last night. The owner gave Kelly a skeptical look. You were the only arrival last night, he told her, and there's no guest named Peter here. Looking over his shoulder, he moved quickly away from her. But Kelly looked up. There was Peter, standing on the upstairs landing, smiling at her. You look like you could use some breakfast, he said, as he came down the stairs. Here, you can share mine. Kelly kept thinking of her encounter with the innkeeper, who could overlook someone like Peter. But she ate gladly, and soon she and Peter were strolling across Limerick to the American Express office, a tiny glassed-in storefront with one entrance in front. Peter waited outside while Kelly went in to sign for her package. But another difficulty lay ahead. We've already received today's delivery from America, the lady explained. There was nothing in it for you. Oh no, not another day of being penniless. The familiar hysteria gripped Kelly and then somehow seemed to recede. Even inside the little office, she could feel Peter's calmness settling around her. Hadn't he said that everything would work out? She decided to trust. What should I do? She asked the clerk. Phone calls were made. Tracers started. A driver alerted. You're in luck, the clerk finally told Kelly. They found the misdirected package, and the truck is on its way back. You might as well wait outside. It may take a while. Kelly went out to explain things to Peter. Once again, she felt no distress just a simple awe at how things seemed to be falling into place. The two talked casually. It was a beautiful day, odd that she had not noticed until now. And then Kelly says, although we had been standing right in front of the shop and no one had gone in or out, nor had any trucks pulled up, the clerk came out. Your package just came in, she told me. It was impossible. But there was her father's familiar handwriting and inside the cash she needed to complete her vacation. Somehow it had reached this obscure store without them noticing, but how? She and Peter were to lunch, then strolled to the bus stop. I'll be going back and forth between Cork and London a few more times, he told her as he wrote his brother's address on a piece of paper. He doesn't have a phone, but here's where I'll be. Kelly gave him her London address. There were no words to tell him how grateful she was. 
His emotional and moral support was just what she had needed. Peter hugged her. In spite of it all, you could have gone to the church, he said gently. It will always accept you, you know. Yes, I know. Somehow she had always known it. She turned away and boarded her bus. The remainder of Kelly's trip went well, and after she returned to London, she sent money and a letter of thanks to Peter at his brother Cork's address. A week later, her letter came back, no such name. It was stamped, no existing address. Kelly stared at the letter, and suddenly it struck her. All the discrepancies she had ignored, Peter entering a locked hostel, the proprietor not seeing him, the American Express package's mysterious arrival, but most of all, that undeniable sense of healing and hope and, yes, forgiveness. Her awareness became a bright light. I had been given a miracle, and I had missed it, Kelly says, but she would not miss another. Today, Kelly is a college graduate, the mother of a young son, and a confident, faith-filled woman, at peace with herself and with God. God does the divine stuff, and I do the legwork, she says. I don't worry about anything. I always feel safe because if I'm doing what I'm supposed to, then he will take care of the rest. She likes to think that Peter McGucky is happy about her change of heart and will tell her so when they meet again. Good night, guys.